let's get started. So, uh, the last time we talked about pack learning, the learnability of the end class, we talked about that multiplicative chain of is going to give us uh, a one over epsilon dependence uh, to get uh, to an error level of epsilon as opposed to Hovding's inequality or additive channel, which only gives one over epsilon squared, uh, which is really lucky, but it was noise free and uh, realizable, and uh, we were a little bit concerned that maybe that's too strong. So uh, today we start with uh, some expansion on this. Uh, so the relaxation of these conditions should get there uh, where we relax the condition that there is no noise. Realizability is still there. You should still get uh, similar results. Uh, but relative to the best that you can do. Uh, so if your data is noisy, then even the best uh, predictor is going to suffer some positive loss. And you compare relative to the best predictor. And you expect that uh, relative to the performance of the best predictor, maybe you can still uh, learn at the one over, at, one over epsilon sample complexity. And uh, so that, that's the first thing. And we do that through oracle inequalities. Uh, uh, this is also a chance to introduce oracle inequalities. Uh, whatever that means, uh, we don't know yet. And uh, in the second part, we start to look into uh, this question of what happens if the function class that we are working with is not finite. It seems very limiting that uh, we have finite classes. And uh, by the way, uh, whatever you do with the infinite classes kind of like applies to the large finite as well. So it's not really about finite or infinite. If your coordinates are both, you know, the, like this, like the coordinates were going into a log, right? Like after coming out of the log, if you get something acceptable, then you're good. But even if after the log, what comes out is too big, you're not happy. Like you know, what goes in two is two to the two to the d. A log applied to it, you still get two to the d. It's not good. Um, so the question is, can you do better? Like when can you do better? Uh, so this infinite versus finite, it's not really about that. Like it's just like maybe the function class has some structure that allows you to do much better than what you could think you can do by counting. Right. Okay, and so uh, that leads to some wonderful topics like empirical processes. Uh, and so we are just touching up on the definitions of like <coughs> what people do there, maybe kind of uh, just speak into that. And uh, we, we start to introduce some tools covering uh, of, of these functional spaces. And uh, today, hopefully, we get to the lower bracketing cover and lower bracketing cover <coughs> numbers and uh, concentration inequalities for uh, um, based on lower bracketing uh, cover numbers for empirical processes, basically. Um, simple. OK. So back to pack learning. Uh, so we had. What about the setting? Uh, we had this concept classes, the C concept class. Uh, it was C D was part of two to the two to the D. It didn't really matter. Um, you could you could do it more generally with F. Uh, if it's finite, it's kind of the same. Uh, so F uh, would be a, a subset of uh, maps from x to y, x is the domain, y is the label set, and uh, maybe the cardinality is finite. So this is, uh, this is what we were starting, and, and uh, the spe specific case of uh, back learning was when y was uh, just uh, the binary, uh, Two things and, and x was the hypercube. 
Okay, uh, so we fixed uh, a distribution over the inputs in this case. So that's d to the d, or, yeah, I, I can't decide whether do the generous thing or not. It's kind of the same. I guess I do the flag because that, that's what we were doing. Um, and, and then you collected the data. That xi is iid from p. And yi is equal to f star applied to x of y, where f star is one element of the constant plus cd. So that's your labeling function. That's your data. The algorithm gives you some fn. And uh, one particle algorithm that we looked at, if it, you can call it an algorithm at all, is erm. I shouldn't call it an algorithm. Uh, it's just ERM. It's like calculate Fn, which is the argument of over your concept class of the empirical laws. So just to recall the empirical laws of any function was in this case counting how many adders the function makes. So here, and here predicting the data. So here, here I am would be like a learning objective and then the algorithm would be something else. Fine. Yeah, this is like, this. the map itself should be called the RM. The map maps data to, it's really a map from data, from DN, predictors. to predictors. It's the ERM map. And uh, whether you can computation efficiently implement it or not, that's, that's, then you're talking about algorithms, right? Like, that's an algorithm. You can have the exhaustive algorithm, which enumerates all the functions, and that, that's like, in this context, maybe it's okay. Like this map, there is an implementation of it on computers, because you can just exhaustively enumerate all the functions. It's a little bit slow, but still an algorithm. Uh, but more generally, if you have, you know, these function spaces, which are what's the reals and whatnot, then it's like, the whole thing, it becomes like, oh, how do you even represent real numbers of computers? Uh, I don't know whether you want to get into that, probably not. Uh, so we sweep these under the hood. <laughs> okay, and, and occasionally we're going to return to this discussion of like, can you do this computationally efficiently? But uh, for a long time, we're just going to talk about the RM. And, and this is this process and uh, computation swept down to the DAG. <coughs> and um, OK. So the last time we were talking multiplicative chat off. Uh, and uh, we already got to uh, the following inequalities. So we got this for every F in CDE. Or, no, 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 okay. So just a big union bound. Uh, this multiplicative channel uh, gives you this. Uh, call it proposition one or, or something like that. Uh, for every delta, integral one, this property of one minus delta, it holds for all f in CD that Lf is smaller than equal to Lnf plus square root 2 Lf log n over delta divided by n. And so this applied the union bound, and um, okay, I think that. If I want to do it, is that I will, I will do the m plus one thing. So at the same time, so it's just one proposition. <laughs> at, at the same time, uh, it holds, uh, huh. <laughs> for 
every delta for every F naught in F. This property 1 minus delta, it holds for all F and for the F naught, the other side of the inequality as well. Sorry, how is F different from F naught and CD? It's like, we, like this, for all of these, if you've seen the probability, scope of probability, sure. this other one is outside, that's the only difference, there is nothing oh, else. Sorry. Is F, I know one's a statement on both the predict, the... One is uniform bound, the other is like, just a, a single function. So I guess I'm asking, what's the difference between F and CD? Huh? You have an F and you have CD, I thought they were... Ah, C, this is CD. Oh, okay. <coughs> C, CD is F. Yeah, that's what I was like. F is CD, CD is F. That was the same. <laughs> I couldn't decide, so I should make them about the same. In the, in the second formula here, we're writing on the left side LN. Oh, oh no, 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 one okay. of them is not LN. This is not LN. Right, why I put it in? Uh, just multiply a chat of applied n plus one times. Both sides, both directions. Like both well, for one, uh, it's like once it's, a, it's the other direction. Oh, for the other direction, you have to have a... Yeah. <laughs> was there a CN? Yeah, it was a 3N. Yeah. No, it was a 3K. What was it a 3K? Where? Is it like what it is? Yeah. Where? No way. F naught. What's the difference between F naught and F? F naught goes outside of the probability. Oh, I see. And so this integrity doesn't hold for every F naught. It only holds for the fixed F naught that you chose. Yeah. This is going to be your favorite F naught that you want to apply this inequality to. It's stated in a weird way. But it's okay. Like we, we were doing this the last time. So the first inequality implies the second inequality? No. I mean, like it's the other way around. Like if oh, oh, okay. it I would see. imply oh, okay. if this was L and this was L N, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. I see. <laughs> so in the last lecture, F naught was F star. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, but like, like you can choose whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, it's for any F naught. It's not for all. Why do we have Call it G. Yeah. Then you feel better about it, or <laughs> <laughs> okay? Then just stick to F naught. Why do we have n plus one in F naught? Because we have n plus one uh, inequalities. N inequalities here, one here. We have to split the data between all the all the inequalities. All the error events need to be accounted for. How many error events? As many as the number of inequalities. It's n plus one. That's it. And like size jointly, like these hold oh, these jointly. Hold yeah, I like it said, this probably one more, one minus that no? for every f and <laughs> and, <just I> and <laughs> f naught <laughs> as well. It should be oh. fixed in f naught, no? Yeah, they fix it. It's like for every fixed f naught, this well, probably one minus that no? for every f, this holds and this also holds. Okay. Tong does the same thing as this. It's fine. Right? Yeah, then it must be fine. Yeah. If it matter if we include delta equals one. What? Delta? Does it matter if we include no. delta equals one? You can include delta equals one if you want. And big N is the size of that. It's like a little bit wacky to say that this property is zero and this inequality is hard. <laughs> <laughs> An inequality hard is this property is zero. Sometimes people include it, but sometimes Hmm? Sometimes people include it. Yeah, it's like it depends on how. Yeah, I don't know what it depends on. It depends on your mood. <laughs> you, you can also ask a question about the zero. Oh. Yeah, we can include zero, and then you divide by zero, you get infinity, and then it's okay. <laughs> so that is bound. Still hot. Hot. Yeah. So why does it hold to zero? Because, because log one over that is going to be infinity. Okay, fine. It's defined. Then I define it. <laughs> <laughs> like one over zero is infinite. If 
we want to talk about it, then it has to be infinite. <laughs> and the log of that is infinite. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, right. That's, what? <laughs> okay. So uh, let's let's apply these things to to ERM. So the last time we talked about that if you have a bunch of inequalities, but those inequalities hold for every function in some set, and you have your function in that set randomly chosen, then the inequality holds if you're swapping this function f to the fn function. Do we have a detailed proof of that? It was simple enough. Like, I think that I will add some more exercises so that you get used to this idea. So, but now I, I just say that, okay, like based on the argument we had the last time, this inequality, this first inequality was for f equals fn. <coughs> That's like a weird thing. If you didn't prove it, then like you shouldn't believe it. But we proved it the last time uh, that this works. And so, um, okay. So let, let's say we are uneven, like these two inequalities hold. Okay, uneven. So call this uh, u. So then on u, uh, I can plug in f n in place of f. Because fn is like yeah one of the f's, so it's like that's that's <coughs> where it matters that f was chosen from cd. Um, so then we have l of fn, and this is what generally we want to bound, right? Like you you pick some predictor, how big is its loss? So this is very convenient. It says that it's not big, just as big. Okay, all right. And then the last time we stopped here and we said, that, oh yeah, like this is zero, but like, okay, what if you have noise? It's not zero, it's not zero. Um, so it's still ERM. So if you pick any other function, oh, this is Fn. Uh, if you pick any other function, like F naught, you get something bigger. This was ERM, and this is because F naught is also in CD. Okay, so F naught is in CD. Fn was the best in CD that minimizes the empirical loss. So, okay, same thing. Okay, so now we have this fixed function. We have on U this inequality also holds. So just chaining the inequalities. And uh, so I had a friend who said that, yeah, you know, Chobo, like, uh, we have like three inequalities that we're playing with and we keep chaining them and they're paying us for it. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so N and of F naught is upper bonded uh, by L of F naught plus two L of F naught log plus one that and divide it by n. And we have the other term. Okay. And we have this other term that I shouldn't forget, the little term. Okay. And this is a theorem, okay? So <laughs> summarize. <laughs> Let's call it a theorem. It's like you have this, I don't know, two-line derivation, then you call it a theorem. Uh, this probability one minus delta for the ERM thingy predictor, it holds that its loss is upper bounded by, so for every F naught in CD, um, this probability one minus that, it holds that the loss of the ERM 
predictor is a proposed by this loss plus two times L F log N plus Just to summarize. And so, since this holds for any F naught, yes? Should there be log n plus 1 over delta over 3n instead of log 1 over delta over 3n? The fraction. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it should have been n plus 1 here. Yeah, just fitting the error problem this. Correct? Okay. All right. Uh, my clever choice for F naught would be the one that minimizes this. So F naught should be chosen, and this is not based on data. It's based on the distribution. Like whatever distribution I have, it gives me the loss function L. Uh, so I can choose the best of this. So that's that's my F star. And and if you write it as that, then we see that corollary of this theorem is that this probability moment is that uh, okay this, this thing holds LFN is smaller than equal to I don't know plug this in int f whatever we had plus all the other junk yeah, you can just like choose the best Okay. So you still for this price of an extra three over n, we were able to get at like L of S R over two. I mean, uh, is, is that the price compared to what? The, the previous thing we had F n. Hmm. And L and F of n. Like this, this first on you. Here? Yeah, that's the original. No, no, I mean like here, okay, so if you go for path learning and then you know that this this will be zero, then you just solve this inequality in LFN, and then you have a bound on LFN. Okay. So if you didn't know that this was zero, then you can go on. Then you have this extra price, the yes. zero price, and you get something very close to what we had before. So now you can ask the question, okay, um, if I somehow managed uh, to get, to modify maybe my losses in such a way that F star gives me zero loss. So it's like offsetting the losses so that, you know, like everything has to suffer some positive loss if you have noisy data because you can't predict noise. But if you subtract the noise, <laughs> you just subtract the constant value from the losses. You just subtract one value, that's it. Then it's zero based. Then the loss of LF star is zero. Okay, what changed? The losses are not between zero and one. They're between this minus value and then one minus the value, right? Like that, that was the loss level, the loss of LF star, uh, F star LF star. So the losses are between minus LF star and one minus LF star now, okay? We have a multiplicative chain of apply. No, we shifted things around. What, what's the negative? Uh, we, okay, so we want to shift it so that we can say that this is zero. If we define the loss, 
by shifting it so that this is zero. Then we look at the rest and like, oh, these guys are zero. So then I have this term and this term. So solving for this LFN, I will get basically the same bound as before. Okay, so the hurdle is that chain of, multiplicative chain of doesn't quite give us this. So we need to do something else. Look at it. But, but this is kind of the idea. Like you're gonna offset the loss. You create a situation such that the loss of the best predictor is zero, but you're subtracting the loss of the best predictor from all the losses, so that's a constant that you're subtracting. That doesn't really change the statistical properties of the problem, it just shifts the loss, okay? Yeah, what? Um, so you wrote originally that F star is the thing that's generating our Y's there, right? Uh, yeah, like that, that was earlier the case. It and was not really used, but I wanted that was to, the fact learning. Right, so but I wanted to ask here, this F star is defined like as a different thing, but wouldn't it that's always, a thing, yeah. wouldn't it always still be that F star there that generates the Y? I'm like, okay, so if, if there was something that generated the data yes. like this. Then it's always equivalent. I mean like, it could be multiple of this, like the lowest oh, sure. that is a unique solution to this, uh, but uh -huh. but yeah. other than that, that would be the same. Okay. Yeah. And the loss minimizing. It's like it's a question of like, is the data distribution sufficiently rich to identify the data generating function? So an identifiability question. Yeah. If it's not, then it's not. Oh, uh, another question is. Uh, You've been writing Fn and all these theorems, but you're not really using the ERM of the R. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, every condition should be used at least once. <laughs> and what were you saying here at the end when you subtract out L of F star from everything that you were saying that a tr multiplicative turn off wouldn't work for this? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, so no, it's like, what's a small, it's like this Bernoulli parameter that is like uh, kind of shifted and like. Kind of but if, if the original negative losses, and that could be helpful. Yeah. Huh? Like we could have negative losses, and those like. Yes. Oh, is the negative thing a problem for churn off? I like mean, it's it's like you have to run it through, and like it's not going to give you that. Like this, the the chain of uh, this this L under the root here. Mm -hmm. It's like the bad only P parameter. It's like the variance, and if you're subtracting things, then it's like uh, it's like not not. Not obvious that the variance, the variance is not the mean anymore. If you subtract it, it's not the mean. And we were writing the mean. So we need to write the variance. The variance will not change. It will still be small. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. So it goes through, but like it doesn't go through just using multiplicative channel. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Sorry, one quick question. For F star, is that the argument of F naught or F? Ha, huh. F not. If I root F not there, then I should write F not there. Good. And you can't just take the absolute value or something after you subtract? No. <laughs> Let us. Why is this F star guaranteed to be in this set? Yeah. We made it so. I mean, like, we didn't say that this F star is that F star. Okay, so all this F star tilde. I, I didn't even write it, but like. You just get the ink. But like the value take, would be the same. Take in the ink of this. Would the ink be the same? No. I mean, if, if that thing gave you a zero, then of course it's a zero. Like the whole thing is a zero. Like in a pack setting, when there is no noise, then this whole thing is zero. And from the oracle inequality, you still get back the fast rate. So with, just with the oracle inequality, you didn't lose anything. Um, so why is it called an oracle inequality? Because you're competing with the oracle that chooses this F not in an oracle fashion, like based on the laws, based on the knowledge of everything. It's the oracle choice. And uh, this inequality expresses the fact that no matter like what the oracle picks, you pay some penalty with your ERM, but the penalty is off of this size only. Like it's, uh, it gives you, uh, a bound on how much you are losing 
because you didn't know the distribution, you only knew the data. Okay, and you're comparing yourself to a product code choice. Yes. So if you're somehow in the setting where there's no noise, you're always gonna be one over and away from the Oracle. That's the price for the ORM. If there was no the noise the and, and the loss is a sensible loss, yeah. Yeah. The price of ERM is one over N. Yeah. Which is maybe good or bad, we have no idea. Yeah, it is. We don't have a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have to You can't do it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we're done with the Oracle inequality. Let's move on. Uh, towards waters with infinite function sets and empirical processes. So, so huh? one more thing. Yeah. I understand this. Where is the abstract coming here? There's no abstract. I'm like, if you can, if you want, you can write this. Instead of, you can make the choice of F not equal to F star. Would That's, that this? would be an oracle choice. So, would you give the same value? But in the case of pack learning, all of this is there. But if it's not, then it might not be. If it's noisy, then it's like the the F star. I don't know what the F star is in that case. Data generating process plus some. Oh, yeah. I see. Then F star was not defined. Then F star would normally be defined as the 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 expression that minimizes the loss. So here we don't quite have that. We have this extra little penalty here that kind of the, combines the loss with square root of the loss times a constant. The minimizer might be a little bit different. The minimum of this is of course upper bounded by if you just plug in the function that minimizes just the loss, right? That's worsening this inequality. And that's often what people do. They say that, oh, the Oracle would choose the loss minimizing function. If they choose it, the inequality holds for that function. So then F, F naught is your loss minimizing function. Yeah? But if you minimize the first term, shouldn't you also minimize the second one? I would always minimize the two terms together, but like if someone decides not to do that, what can I do with them? The inequality still holds, it holds for any F naught, it holds for the F naught that maximizes the loss. It even holds for that. <coughs> it holds for any F naught. Yeah? It's somewhat worse choice not to minimize the sum of the two terms. Is it a big difference? Probably not. Mostly not. That's why people don't care. But ideally, you should always choose every star. Right? I don't think that you can choose. I mean, like, I don't know what it means, like ideally you should choose F star. Like I mean, that, that's going to give you the tightest bond. No, the tightest bond is the bond that you're minimizing this because you yes. already have this term and you will make your life worse if you're not minimizing the sum of these two things yes, but and you choose F star, which is not minimizing the sum of two things. But uh, what I'm saying is that the, the minimizer of the first and the second term, that's um, it's the same one. No. Isn't it like monotonic in hell left? Or no? Exactly. Like that but like, like, okay, so you have the function. Okay. Right. You're just, yeah. And F, F star minimizes it. Yeah. Just that it's not just an F star which is there, but like you have this extra penalty. Okay. But that's only if L is positive. Hmm? If L is positive? Oh no. Oh, it is. Because in zero one, they're uh, so negative. Yeah, oh. losses are zero or one. Yeah, yeah. Here, here it was important, otherwise, you couldn't do this multiplied shadow. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, let's move on. 
So you can see that all, in all of these computations, and uh, Tong also, also writes this out, uh, this quantity always shows up in both directions. You can take the absolute value, and if you're able to bond the maximum value on this, then you're happy. So this LNF is, uh, if you write it out, is just a sample mean of the losses. And you compare that to uh, the mean value. So whenever you have something like this, so you can I, I even write this, or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, so you have these random variables call them I don't know, B I. They are indexed by um, these functions that leave in this function space. But the index set doesn't really matter at this stage. So you have bi, which maps f to reverse. It's a random function. Random function is called a process. So you take these, you take the average of these, And then you take the absolute value. OK, sorry, not, not there. You take the absolute value, and then you take the soup. So you want to characterize the maximum deviation of uh, the average of these processes. And so this is a process. And you have these di's are coming from the same distribution. So d1, dn come from some distribution E of D, that IID. You take its sample average, select by F, you take the deviation, and you, you want to know, does this go to zero as and gets large or not, by and large? Can you control this? We were controlling this by, you know, using Chernow, multi derivative, positive, whatnot. And we were showing that uh, where f was finite, then its sizes of, uh, I don't know, square root log uh, number of functions in f divided by delta over n. Um, and yeah, so this is called an Enrique process. And empiric process theory is like a big area of uh, probability theory that analyzes the question of convergence of these processes towards zero in different ways. Like, does the central limiterium hold for processes of this kind if appropriately normalized? Does this converge to zero uh, with probability one? Does this converge to zero in probability? These are the questions. If it converges to zero in probability, so that's the weak law of large numbers. Um, so let's call it, I don't know, Why is B, B, I different from a random variable? Because for each function, you have a random variable. It's like, it's indexed by these functions. Or it's uh, well, we didn't say whether it's measurable or not. It's just some index set. It's like collection of random variables. It's many random variables. Every DIF is a random variable, and you have as many as the number of functions. So that's not the Oh, it's the function. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Never mind. Absolutely. 
some confiscator. Right? There was no free market or that. Okay. So p n converges to zero in probability as n goes to infinity, and that's called weak law of applied in there. And uh, when this happens, then we say that uniform convergence happens. Uniform in the sense that you have a supreme over all, all functions f. So, I don't know. Maybe I should. Call, I, I don't call this pn. I call this I don't know. B upper bar n or something. And that, that's a property of like how rich was this function space in a way. So let's do this in a in a slightly more general form, and it will make more sense. And this is also the notation I'm going to use uh, uh, later. So you can also see from all of these uh, all of these calculations that all these functions appear just inside the lo a loss function. That we always plug in the loss function. The functions never appear in any uh, expressions except when they are already plugged in, in the loss function. Right? So you're composing the loss function with the function all the time. Okay? So it makes sense to introduce this space, which is the loss space, which is the composition of the loss and, of, and the predictor. Right? And so from now on, we're just going to talk about this loss space. We, we will not talk about, like, we don't need to talk about the structure of the loss space. It doesn't really matter. What is, what is this loss space? Uh, so I'm going to call this G. This loss space could be, like, this is all x, y mapped to the loss of f, x, and y where f is in f. Okay, so loss function together with f induces this, this uh, other function space, g. So g is, you know, um, goes from x cross y to the reals. Yeah. So this result, isn't this uh, basically what we show in the assignment, but even stronger no. with uh, that it converges almost surely? So we are showing that the tails, I don't know, in the assignment? So right, yeah. In the assignment, we are, so the, in the assignment, there is no supremo over f. So we didn't do that. So uh, what's distinguishing here things is that we have to account for many of these functions and like many of, like simultaneously, everything has to be small. I mean, there you had that this thing held with probability of one. Uh, and the these between the strong and the weak law? The strong law would be uh, this converges to zero with probability one. The weak says that in probability <coughs> it converges to one, uh, zero. Mm -hmm. Just the order of P and then. Yeah. Maybe why doesn't this also satisfy the strong? Why do we choose the weak? Maybe that's the question. Well, why people study the weak? Uh, oh, the, no, why it, it's because in all these statements, you want a high probability statement. High probability statement is basically a big law. I, I mean, like, you don't take the limit. We don't take the limit. This n goes to infinity. But, like, you know, all these people would take the limit and then we just talk about the limits. Uh, if you don't talk, talk about the limit, but you're interested, what's the probability that my thingy is big? It's like what appears in the weak law. <laughs> but it happens that, that there is this correspondence between the strong law and the weak law. That if you're controlling these probabilities in a very nice way, in a way that this this probabilities as n go to infinity, they decay really fast, exponentially fast. Like in our case, that's how fast they decay. So there is some summability condition. Okay, Borak contrary, yeah. and then the strong law of large number is also going to hold again. So it's like you're just doing controlling for every n, the tail probabilities, and if you're lucky then your contract is really strong, and it also gives you the strong law, it will definitely give you the weak law. Mm -hmm. uh, for that, you need much fewer conditions. Um, 
so then, you know, people choose sides and like, machine learning people decided not to even talk about whether this convergence ever happens because you just have a finite end and you want to quantify uh, how well you know things, how big the losses are. So it's like, a, in a way, a more precise understanding uh, of how things work, but at the price of maybe blowing up some constants. Because the, what the probability people can do is by taking the limit, they can calculate, you know, exact exponents, exact constants, and like unimprovable bonds, and we just have extra factor of two here, or a hundred, or a billion. <laughs> um, we, we use the weak law over the strong law because it's, we can we can get a, both a finite time and an asymptotic result for it, where if we just thought about the strong law, it doesn't make sense in the asymptotic. It doesn't make sense in like a finite end. Well, not like mm -hmm. if, if you if your end is finite, then like you don't care about this convergence at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, what does that have to do with finite? Well, you said that we prefer. I mean, in a way, it's like, in a way, you like okay. So the learning process is working if your errors are under control. Okay, your errors are under control if this uniform convergence happens. Actually, it's actually to. So the weak law is going to be exactly correspond to learnability if you define learnability that, oh, in the limit of infinite data, do I learn optimum thing or not? If you want to do that in a universal fashion, then you need to have the weak law of large numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's sufficient and necessary mm -hmm. for like a lot of cases. And then, okay, so that, that's why this empirical process theory is highly relevant. Uh, but we don't, like we, so in pack learning, for example, you try to quantify the sample complexity, which is like a more fine-grained understanding. You ask the hard question, or like the question of like, but is it polynomial in these quantities? Like, does it go to zero fast enough? And you're not happy if it doesn't go fast enough, uh, zero. Yeah, I guess I was just asking, since this is, I was wondering <coughs> if you put the question in the assignment for some reason to relate to this and then show us that sometimes it is even stronger that it holds like almost surely. I think that no, that that assignment is somewhat related, but it's not. But I think it is the yeah. same thing, but maybe we can talk about it after. No, because in probability, the limit is outside the probabilistic thing. It's the limit is n goes to infinity of the probability. We, we are not taking any soups over yeah. there. Like you're just taking a random f, and then this, this, the test set is independent of the, the training set. And I just made your life complicated by well, choosing a random function there. But uh, just to teach a point about conditional distributions and, but yeah, it's very unrelated. Like there was a separate test set and train set in the exercise. Here, this is like training set convergence. It's like on the training set, like you can measure performance. Like if this weak low happens, you don't need test set. I mean, like, you better use a test set, but because uh, everything will be much faster, cleaner, better bonds, everything is just better. Uh, but uh, they, they also test you that if you cannot afford a test set, you're okay. But it's kind of weird because if n gets large, like a limit of n goes to infinity, n must be large, mm -hmm. then how come you can't afford a test set? <laughs> That's nonsense. But anyway, I'm, I'll talk about, I don't want to waste more time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, uh, let's, let's move on. Okay, so, okay, so law space. And, and so also writing this X and a Y, like it has no, like no, we are just working is this law space. So from no one, you're gonna have G, which is a subset of R to the Z. The, if some, in all the examples, um, uh, pretty much, uh, Z uh, has this product structure. Uh, but we don't care. Like, you can write all the theorems just with G, which is a subset of RZ, R to the Z. And uh, then this empirical process question can be phrased in the following way. It's much more elegant, uh, and it's, it's equivalent phrasing. So you have uh, Z1, Zn coming from a distribution 
over his head. And it's IIV. So you create the Amplica distribution. So the Amplica distribution is going to be, you know, the direct data uh, placed where your data is. You know, like these spikes. It's like you had the data lives in the Z space, it was here, you spike up. So you create this measure. It's like basically if you have a set, what's the measure of the set based on this measure? It counts how many times you hit the set with your sample. Okay, so you create this, this measure. This is a probability measure over Z. It's a counting measure. Okay? It's a random counting measure because your sample was random. So PN is random. Okay? It's called the empirical probability distribution. Okay? So PN, the name of it is empirical distribution. Because it's based on the data that you had. It's like the best approximation to P. Uh, if you have some data in many ways, it's like it summarizes all the data. It's actually that you're having the data to, to know what PN is. What is IID setting for sure? Yeah. C times PN? I don't know what. C so that's part of the plot. That's, 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 the that's part of the plot. That was the Z, Z, Z space is here. Uh, this is the Z, Z space. It's like the 0 1 interval. And this is very different between the G you have written and the Z in the beginning and the G in the box. This is different. This was an example of what the G could be, and then I'm saying that from no on, I just take G to be a subset of R to the Z. That's it. We're not going to talk about the structure of it. That always a loss and a predictor composed. Is there any reason why the G's look different, or is <laughs> no? It's the same. <laughs> No, no, yeah, no deep reason for that. Okay. <coughs> so some more notational changes. So if you have a probability measure over Z, well, it could be any any measure. In fact and you have a function from Z to Rios, which is measurable, then we have this integral of the function. And it's a lot of characters to write this, one, two, three, four characters. Too much. You just write PF, simple. It's like P is an operator, it acts on a function, what does it do? It gives you the, the value of the integral of the function. Against this measure. Uh, so if everything was finite, this would be like minimal problem. No, it's it's more, no. This is a matrix. This is more like a matrix uh, multiplying a vector. That's how you should be thinking about it. So what is it? What's P is a stochastic? No, yeah, but whatever. Like it's just the thing. P is a measure. P is a measure. Like the, the meaning of this symbol oh, sequence I see. I see what is defined with the integral. So. It's a definition, so this is definition of, of the sequence of symbols, so that I don't have to write that much. It was too much writing. Okay, so now you have Pn, and you have P. So what you can do is that you can take Pn G minus Pg. It's almost Pg almost. And um, so this is the same deviation as what you see here. Okay, this would be G of Z I, and uh, this is uh, P applied to, to G. And you have the average of those. So P N applied to G, or P N applied to anything. So Dirac, Dirac data, what they do is that they measure the function 
at those points where the probability masses are and then sum them up. You divide by, by n. So I write this out. Um, so the V of that applies to, to, to G. Uh, so this is just Linux. So V of that applies to G. That's G evaluated at ZI. Because I have to integrate the function against my Dirac data. And as we agreed, the Dirac data, what it does is that this measure that counts. And so there's a counting measure that gives you a count of one if you're hitting the set ZI. So the integral, if you work through it, what it comes to is that this is just a point of variation of G at ZI. Okay, so that follows from the definition of the integral as an MC. Okay, um, so this whole thing is equal to <coughs> G of ZI minus P. Okay, so that's the same thing as over there. So much shorter notation, much more elegant. From now on, we're gonna use this. And the Antonyker process looks like taking the supreme over the G of P and G minus P. Okay. These are the deviations that we are going to try to control. Think about the G as the loss space, yes. What's the difference of the Dirac of ZI or the indicator? Are they the same thing? Hmm? Like what's the difference of the Dirac function or the indicator function? Uh, the indicator function takes a logical argument. The Dirac is a measure. Oh yeah. Integrate over the oh yeah. I guess you could write the mm -hmm. indicator integrate over the measure, and it might be equivalent in some sense. So, if you want to indicate that ZI is in a set U, you can write that. So that's what Dirac ZI gives you for U. So that, that's the connection between the two. So that's the definition of the Dirac. Yeah. So the Dirac can be defined in terms of the indicator. What? So the U on the bottom and ZI on the bottom? That's not how it works. At least not in my notation. I always put here, like this is DZ, this is the set, that's where the sets go. Sets go here. Okay. Yeah. You use some structure in this notation, right? Or we don't care. Hmm? We lost the structure. Yeah, because we don't use the structure. <laughs> and it's unnecessary detail. It slows us down. So people realize this, people work in the law spaces. And they just study these deviations. Everything that we wrote can be rewritten in this notation. Much shorter. Much clearer. Go ahead. So let's do some some work with uh, with this. Uh, bounding this empirical care process. Um, so introduce the definition of lower bracketing covers. So let G be, and my G's are changing from line to line. Um, but they're always the same. Don't ask me why. And the Z as well, like, I would try to write this, but then I would need to be slow, and I don't know. Okay, you get used to it if you don't, if you have doubts, ask me, as you <laughs> did before. Uh, and, uh, okay, so fix a P measure on on Z. Um, we say that G1, Gn, 
these functions is a lower bracketing cover of G uh, slash P, G and P together, like sensitive to P, if the following holds two things. First, for every G, there must be, okay, not, not, not like this. For every G, we want to cover G in a way, and we want to kind of sandwich G, which is kind of a loss, uh, from below and from above. Uh, there exists um, an index in M, such that the function that we are picking satisfies two things. It's below function G, and on expectation with respect to P, it's above up to epsilon. Okay, so fix epsilon 2 and cover of G at P at scale. So epsilon is called the scale if the following words. Okay, so this is the definition. So it's almost you can change these things. And they're just set up in such a way that if we have a lower bracketing cover for some set G at some scale with respect to this, this measure, then it will work really well for bounding or empirical process in one direction. What if yeah. the first one mean, like by assume, assume let's say vectors? Yeah, 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 okay. So uh, functions are like vectors. Mm -hmm. So when you compare vectors, inequality means that each component is less than equal. So in the case of functions, that also means that each value of the function, the two functions are weighted at the same point, are less than equal. Okay. Yeah. Like the point usual wise ordering point of functions. Huh? Point wise thing. Point wise thing. Yeah. Almost sure. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Not almost sure. You could do almost sure, but we're not that good. That that big, what is that big N? Huh? That big N. Is it little N? What is the, what, what is the what? Bracket, bracket. Okay. You exist J in that. Oh, small. this uh, is the numbers from 1 to okay. no. small N. Yeah. Okay. Right? Okay. Ethereum. So we're going to leverage our inequalities that we learned. So we're specializing to the losses between 0 and 1. Um, picking whatever distribution we have. And then we, we just care about one side inequalities. Then, then the following holds. Uh, we struggle with one. So for all, every data in zero one uh, with probability one minus delta for every g it was that pg can be upper bounded by p and g plus the smallest number that you can get if you optimize epsilon where you have oh I didn't introduce this Okay. All right. So, pick any G, pick any P, pick any data. We're going to calculate the number, an epsilon, which is the size 
of the smallest lower bracketing cover of G at P at scale epsilon. So this N epsilon depends on G P epsilon. Okay, I only denote the dependence on epsilon because here I'm taking, I'm changing epsilon here. I'm not changing P or G, okay? So this N epsilon, let me write it down. Is called the lower bracketing number of G uh, P epsilon, which is the smallest n such that there exists G1, Gn, such that G1, Gn is a lower bracketing cover of G at P at epsilon. Okay? So this is kind of standard notation for this. We were asking for the N. Hmm? No, I have more questions. I, I have a question about this lowercase n. Is it like the same n? And the definite, like the definition for G1 to N, and then the PN. There is a little N, and there is a big N. Uh, but in the definition, is it also like the same N? What well, uh, the And the definition of the problem. Oh, like it's like, okay, that's, that's, that's not important. Well, like, I mean, like, it's a local variable in the definition, right? Yeah. So, it's like, the definition has its scope. Okay. So, little N. And, like, whenever a definition environment comes, it's a local scope. Yeah, the little one is a number of data points, right? So yeah. from no on, I assume that, okay, yeah, PN is defined as it was defined over there. So if I say, let's fix P, and I write PN, so that's just the empirical distribution corresponding to P, which means that you either the sample from P and data points, take the empirical distribution corresponding to those points, Okay, yes. So this capital G, are these little g's in the capital G? They're not, <laughs> they're not. And that's important, like you, you can, like if we don't, we don't act, yeah, like we're lucky not to require that. Like I'm, I'm a little confused, yeah. I'm they're confused just, on what this is saying with this covering, like usually I, I thought it was gonna say like some set there are strict covers, covering. yeah, there are strict covers where, uh, like, generally when, when you're covering, then you could be considering just elements of the space that you're trying to cover. Yeah. And sometimes you're allowed to, to go outside, that you have to be careful about which one you're doing. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm definitely doing the one that goes outside of the set, and I have good reasons for doing that. I'm just confused. So you're trying to cover G? Yeah. It's like... Oh, I see. Okay, that's fine. I see. Okay, and... Another question, like this covering thing, like I'm like B is kind of what I expected, where you'd you'd kind of say something like you're trying to cover this P of G with P of G J's, and they're like epsilon close to P of G, right? Yeah. But then is the lower bracketing part just the A inequality? Like that's a weird thing to see for the covering. Okay, so it's not on the board, but in all the previous calculations, when we were doing it, yeah. we needed uniform bounds one side. Yeah. We didn't need uniform bounds the other side. So this lower bracketing number is just about that. We only need one-sided bounds. This is not sufficient for us to bound the empirical process if you use the absolute value. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then you would do both sides. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That is a version of that. It's called the bracketing number. We will cover that too, just for completeness, but the lower bracketing number is what you actually need in machine learning or when in learning theory you are doing these calculations. And it's just coming from that, we needed all the inequalities just one-sided, the uniform inequalities had to be one-sided. Uh -huh. Yeah, we needed this, this B direction one, I guess. Yeah. But what's with the little g's inequality? 
Like, why do the, like, if I just interpret it as, like, GJ is the loss, the empirical loss, should be less than the... Yeah, so this is, like, the uniform bond for the enteric loss. Yeah. This is a uniform bond for whatever G you choose or whatever predictor you would choose. The underlying loss is not larger than its enteric loss plus some quantity. And, okay, mm -hmm. so the innovation compared to what we were doing before is that previously we just counted how many functions we have, but right now we are throwing away infinitely many of them potentially. So one example when this would come up, like the very first example, silly example, maybe I should have started with that, is that uh, you just have the zero one interval, one, and like, okay, so you move outside of pack learning, on the zero one interval, you want to learn threshold functions. The data is generated with a threshold function too. So what's a threshold function? The threshold function has a threshold, theta, above theta, it gives you a value of one, below theta, it gives you a value of zero. Okay, and so maybe there is some noise on, on the top of it, like with probability P, you uh, miss the labels, whatnot. Okay, you don't know theta. You take uniform distribution over X, you know that this is how the, the data was generated, and you run, I don't know, empiric risk minimization. In this case, again, you can calculate the empiric risk minimizer uh, because it's just like, you know, see, it's like, oh, like I had the data here. There is no reason to go finer between the data points than just like considering half of them. Like that doesn't change how many errors you're making. It was zero one loss. And so you consider all possibilities. It's like if you had n data points, you have like n plus one, whatever, like something like that, right? Enumerate all of them, choose the one that gives you the best value, all the thresholds are considered. That's your ERM. You found your ERM. You want to know how well are you doing? What was the set, the function set? It was an infinite set, because you were considering all possible threshold functions. The counting arguments we had wouldn't work anymore. But that seems silly, like this should be learnable. So the lower bracketing numbers are going to save us. And what is going to save us as well is that uh, this G's, this loss cover, it doesn't have to be uh, in the function space. Mm -hmm. I'm still just trying to understand the property A in the definition, basically. Like why, like are we going to use this? Is it intuitive? What's happening with that thing? The intuitive, okay, so let, uh, just look at here. This is what we want to prove. Yeah. Where does this come from? It comes from because previously we had to use, when we were thinking about the ERM proofs, mm -hmm. we had to use a uniform bound of this type. Mm -hmm. So we're just writing that. Like we want a uniform bound where we are bonding the actual loss uniformly with the empiric loss. Okay, but isn't that part B? No, okay, let's write the proof. Uh, let's, uh -huh. yeah, like you, <laughs> so, the definition is made up, made in such a way that the proof works. Yeah, I believe it. I'm just trying to, I guess we'll see uh, if now. You, Yeah, like if you do the proof, <laughs> then maybe yeah. we'll be done with the discussion. <laughs> okay, so fix uh, the G, fix the P, fix the data, fix an epsilon. Okay, we fix all those things. And then we're going to optimize the epsilon. And uh, let's get a cover. Okay, so we got this uh, function G1. Uh, G of, uh, oh yeah, M. M is uh, N epsilon. Okay. Okay, you, you got the lower bracketing cover. And then fix, for all of these guys, we can run channel. That's clear. So let's try that. Do we know this exists? N epsilon is finite? Or we so we assume that n epsilon is finite. If it's not finite, it's all, all, all good. It works because you plug in an infinite. <laughs> Doesn't need to assume. Um, OK. So channel. And we're going to write the, the standard channel. So what, what do we know? Uh, we know that with probability 1 minus data, for every j within m, which is n epsilon, uh, p of g of j is smaller than or equal to p n of g of j plus 
square root, um, log, and uh, m or n epsilon. I, I write n epsilon over 2 n. Okay? Good. So take this event, when these inequalities fall for every chain, so this is your good event here. And now assume that this event falls. Okay, we're gonna pick an arbitrary G. Okay, so on new, the following is going to fall. So PG, we need to upper bound PG. Okay, that's easy. There exists a J such that G of J is less than or equal to J and PG is less than or equal to P of GJ plus epsilon. Okay, pick that J. So there exists, so for this G, there exists this J in M such that A and B hold from the definition. So P of G is uh, because of B, I propounded uh, by P of uh, GJ plus epsilon. P of GJ by Chanov is now propounded by PN of GJ plus epsilon plus this uh, square root log business. Okay. Okay, and um, now G of J is propounded by G. So then PN is a non-negative operator or positive operator. So that means, well, if you have two functions, one is pointwise less than equal than the other, then the integrals mm -hmm. have the same ratio. The integral of the first function that was less than equal is less than equal then the integral of the second function. It's called a positive operator. Pn is also a positive operator. All of these integral operators are positive operators. That's nice. So from gj smaller than equal to g, it follows that Pn, g of j. This is like a very fancy way of saying something trivial. Uh, because, I mean, P and G, J is like, you evaluated G, J at points, and like at those points, the G is bigger, and it's like, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, okay, anyways, uh, so continuing, so this is because of A. So, all right, so P of G, J is up propounded by P, N of uh, G, and then plus epsilon plus uh, the square root. Um, and you're done, right? So epsilon was arbitrary, you can take the int from both sides, you're done. Yeah. I have one question. Um, is there any relationship between the g's, the lowercase g's, in the definition? Like, because I'm wondering what is this minimum here, if there is no relationship between the g's. I, I know that there exists one, then I could just choose oh. one. Right? Oh, sorry. Look at that. Uh, so these have to satisfy the definition. Yes. What's the question? Like, you can always, like, if it is satisfied for certain specific n, then it is also satisfied for one. Because I can just pick. Oh, really? Like this I has to hold for every G. Yes, right. but Tower, not for every right. J, right? Huh? But not for yeah. every J, not for every index. For every G, yes. there has to be a J. Yes. So there, if there is one, only one in those N Gs, I can just pick that one. This J changes depending on what this is. If you are not using one of these, yeah, throw it away. But as G is moving, the J index is also jumping okay, around. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So it's not clear that J depends on G. 
it's clearly, yeah, okay. like for every chi, there exists a J, so you can dance, yeah. Like sometimes you, you write chi, oh, yeah, made of chi. Yeah. I see now where the two, but I thought through this, like, I thought it would be like G, J is like epsilon close to G or something. Because, yeah, they and then are you have kind like, of like just in the necessary way so that the proof works. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a minimum requirement to make this proof work. Uh, it's like there is nothing else to it. I see. But like when we actually find coverings of like some loss function or something, we're gonna people do more work usually than this. It's because uh, if you systematically want to cover something, mm -hmm. then this is like too one off to, to think about this. And there are more systematic ways of doing this. And so we talk about that a lot, of like how you can automate the process of discovering coverings of loss spaces. And this would be just like the end goal of doing all those coverings. Usually you end up doing more. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't re really change the results, so you don't care. So even though this is a finer concept, then the concepts that people use, it's not doing too much in a way that like you're not losing because you're doing the cruder things later. Well, like you, you read the, over the yeah. cruder things later and like mostly that's what people use in the typical paper, papers. This is the finest grain version of it, which is really tailored to that. You just want to get this one-sided inequalities just this way. Okay, now you can also imagine that if I didn't use Hovding's inequality, I use multiplicative chain of, you would get a similar inequality. I'm not even mm -hmm. going to bother to write it down. Maybe, yeah, I'm out of time anyways, and, and that's where I wanted to finish. Uh, so, yeah. And so, okay, summary. Uh, we covered the infinite spaces, lower bracketing covers, Next time we're going to talk about the other types of covers and uh, other nice uh, things that, that you can do with it.